Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our fifth virtual O'Connor Chair Lecture. I'd like to take just a minute to recognize some folks who are with us tonight. Ms. Amy Warner, Director of the A. Lindsay and Olive B. O'Connor Foundation. It's through the generosity of the O'Connor Foundation that this evening's event is possible and we thank you. Dr. Darren Reesberg, Hartwick College President. Dr. Laurel Bongiorno, Hartwick College Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculty. Karen McGrath, Senior Vice President of Enrollment, Management and Student Experience. Lisa Ionello, Director of Corporate Foundation and Government Relations. Sharon Dettenreiter, Professor Emeritus, former Department of Nursing Chair and Nursing Program alum. Distinguished guests, faculty chairs, faculty, staff, students, and finally, I'd like to thank Nursing's Events and Community Committee for putting this wonderful event together. We're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Darren Reesberg, President of Hartwell College, joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome him to his inaugural O'Connor Chair Lecture and to invite him to make some opening remarks. Dr. Reesberg. Thank you so much, Pat. It's my absolute pleasure to join you tonight for this year's O'Connor Chair Lecture. Always a special event here at Hartwick College, whether it's in person or virtually like tonight. And tonight, like you said, is extra special for me because it's my first O'Connor Lecture during my presidency, having just started here at Hartwick four months ago. And what a way to start with a lecture by superstar Dr. T. Stevens. I wanna offer my deep gratitude uh, to Amy and the A. Lindsay and Olive B. O'Connor Foundation uh, for their generosity in continuing to support our Department of Nursing's ability to bring distinguished leaders and scholars like Dr. Stevens to the Hartwick College nursing and broader community. Lectures like these expand our knowledge, inspire us, and for those in the nursing and related fields, help ensure you have a greater impact on the lives of those you aim to improve. Which brings me to our heroes here at Hartwick, our nursing faculty, staff, and students. Guided by the princi principles of rigor, excellence, and empathy, you're devoted to ensuring that those with need will receive the highest quality of care. These are very tough times. Hospitals are turning away patients because of nursing shortages, and there are not enough qualified nursing faculty nationally to replenish the ranks. Yet here at Hartwick, because of the support of funders like the O'Connor Foundation, uh, our state-of-the-art facilities, and the quality of faculty and alumni, we continue to attract the best and brightest students to help change the world for the better. So, along with our faculty and our students and others joining tonight, I can't wait to learn, and we'll turn the floor back to you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, President Reesberg. Professor Kathleen Ash is chair of our events and community committee and is serving as our moderator this evening. Kathleen graduated from Russell Sage College where she earned a bachelor of science degree in nursing. Soon after graduating, Kathleen joined the birthing center at Bassett Medical Center in Cooperstown where she applied and developed her knowledge and skill in the care of women, children and families. In 1994, she earned a Master of Science degree in nursing as a clinical nurse specialist with a concentration in parent-child nursing from the Sage Graduate School. While at Bassett, Kathleen served in the capacity of a staff nurse and as a clinical nurse specialist. She collaborated in the creation and launch of a new obstetric operating room, implemented the electronic medical record system, ensured nursing practices were evidence-based, educated nursing staff on clinical practice and coordinated care with inpatient and outpatient services. After serving as an adjunct clinical professor in obstetrics for Hartwell College for 11 years, in 2019, Kathleen joined the Hartwell College Department of Nursing full-time as a clinical assistant professor of nursing. Her nursing expertise is in women's and children's health and rural health or interests lie in women's health issues, care of newborns, and healthcare in rural populations. She's a member of the Association of Women's Health, Obstetrics, and Neonatal Nursing, and Sigma Theta Tau. She is an outstanding educator and colleague. 
please join me in welcoming Professor Kathleen Ash. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Pat. I welcome everyone here tonight to hear this presentation on resilience. And I want to just read, I'll give you a little bit of background on our presenter tonight, Dr. T. Stevens. Dr. T. Stevens is a nurse educator, a researcher, and consultant with over 35 years experience in both practice and academic settings, from adjunct faculty to dean. She is the author of the Stevens Model of Resistance and founder and chief boat rocker of RN Prep, Personal Resilience Enhancement Plan. She is the host of the podcast RN Prep. Her research is focused on resilience, specifically as a tool to promote well being and professional fulfillment in nurses, nursing students, and other clinicians. Much of this work is built upon the narratives of Holocaust survivors. She is a certified nurse educator and serves as a consultant, advisor, and member of several professional organizations, task force, and work groups. Dr. Stevens received her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from East Tennessee State University, her Master's of Science in Nursing from King College, a postdoctorate certificate in nursing education from the University of Tennessee, and her Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Tennessee. She is the author of multiple publications and book chapters and a frequent presenter at national, regional, and international conferences and workshops. Dr. Stevens serves as a consultant to multiple organizations and is an associate professor for Galen College of Nursing. She lives with her husband, Scott, in Blountville, Tennessee, and also in the Isle of Palm, South Carolina, with a menagerie of critters. Her favorite role, however, is Noni to her beloved Emmy mm -hmm. and Owen. I welcome you tonight, Dr. Stevens, and we have been here at Hartwick really looking forward to this night with great anticipation, and I am grateful to you for coming. So I will now present, give you the floor to do your presentation. Thank you. Oh, Kathleen, thank you so much. That was just such a lovely welcome. and. Um, it, it's just an honor to be with all of you tonight. I um, have had a great um, experience in getting to know Kathleen and Pat and Janine um, over the past few months as I have been planning this and talking to them about um, Hartwick and learning a little bit about your, your beautiful uh, area and your college there. And um, I've greatly enjoyed meeting uh, President Riesberg um, over the past couple of days. And I, it, it sounds like you all have just a fabulous place to learn and grow there. And so um, it's an honor for me to be with you tonight. I want to say a big thanks to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Gigi Smith, who is a graduate of Hartwick's um, nursing program and also part of your board of trustees. And uh, she's the one that connected me to all of you. So thank you, Gigi. Um, and um, with that being said, we're going to dig right in and um, we're going to talk about my favorite topic, which, which is resilience. So let me go ahead and share my screen now. And the topic for tonight is life on purpose, the gift of a resilient mindset. And in this presentation, I'm going to share my journey in this area of research, where it began and where it's gone over the past two decades and where it's going in the near future. If you will notice on the screen, there is a picture of a tree. And I use this tree in all of my work and uh, it has become the symbol of resilience to me. In fact, I have a painting of this tree that a friend of my son's did for me um, quite a few years ago hanging in my office. But if you look at this tree, it's not had an easy life, has it? It's, it's experienced some difficulties along the way. And we can tell that because we don't normally see that amount of roots when we look at any tree. There's been some really harsh living for this tree. But despite the challenges that it has faced in its life, it didn't die. In fact, it didn't just survive, but it continued to grow and thrive. And we can tell that because it's produced beautiful foliage despite the challenges it's faced. 
how did it do that? Well, if you look at the bottom, at the roots, not only did it rely on the roots that it had, but you can see that new roots have emerged to stabilize it and to hold it steady in the midst of the storms that it faced. That's resilience. And resilience is not just about surviving. Resilience is an opportunity to actually grow and become better despite the adversities or even because of the adversities we face. And I'm going to tell you what I have learned through the past two decades of this research and how I came to learn that and exactly how we can embrace this knowledge and learn to grow through the challenges that we all face, which we do. It's inevitable, um, especially if you're in the healthcare field. You know that there are many, many challenges that we face, both in practice and in the academic setting. And we need this resilience, this increased level of resilience in order to successfully navigate the seas of change, but also to grasp the opportunities that we have to become better as a result of that. So let me advance this slide here. So I'm going to begin talking about my own journey of resilience. And this is me in 1986 as a brand new nurse. Now, I was like many new nurses, and if there's any students in the audience or new graduate nurses, a special hello to all of you. Um, my work began because of you, and you are still a huge part of my heart and why I do what I do. But I recognized the need for resilience back when I was a new graduate nurse. Now, I didn't call it resilience. I didn't quite understand what it was, but I knew there was a need. And I entered the workforce like many of you probably have if you work in healthcare or especially if you are a nurse. And I was so excited and I was just thrilled to be joining a profession that I loved and I had dreamed about being a part of for a long time. I had passed my licensure exam, I had gotten the job that I wanted, and I was ready to take on the world. Now, my shock was that not everyone in the work environment was as excited to see me as I was to see them. It, I was not met with open arms in all cases. Now, I was prepared for difficulties. I think that any of us that enter any kind of a clinician role or work in healthcare, know that it's not going to be easy. We're going to face challenges every day. It's not easy work physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. There are a lot of challenges, but we understand that. And it's part of the reason we go into it, a lot of us, because we want to help people who are in those situations. But I was not prepared for the other stressors that I faced that just seemed so difficult to handle. The workplace issues, the incivility, the, um, just all of the different things that added to an already stressful job, things that didn't have to be there, things that shouldn't have been there. And I recognized that it wasn't just me, that it was many of my colleagues as well. And the, those that I had graduated with me that I had kept in contact with, they were experiencing the same things. And it made me realize that we had a real problem in our profession. I had never heard of nurses eating their young. I didn't realize I was entering a profession where cannibalism was embraced, but that seemed to be the case. And I, it was a harsh reality. I experienced what is true culture shock. And I remember very distinctly during that first year standing in the medicine room and as background, the first 20 plus years of my practice was mostly in the emergency trauma setting. And I loved that work. And I was standing in the medicine room preparing to deliver blood to a trauma patient. And I remember thinking to myself, this is stressful enough. I shouldn't be distracted by all of these other things that are going on that shouldn't be. And I made myself a promise way back then, almost 36 years ago, that if I ever had the chance to make it better for other new nurses, that that's what I would do. That really set my path. And I never forgot that promise. 
And so I tried every way I could in practice to make a difference and to change the systems and to change the culture. Um, I served in leadership roles. I taught a lot of classes. I served as a preceptor, all of those things. And I hope I made a difference. But I recognized soon that it went much deeper than that and that there were changes that needed to be made in academia in order to better prepare students for the realities of the workplace, because I was not prepared. I was a good nurse, but I wasn't a good nurse in the environment. I did not know what to do with all of that. So I went back to school to uh, get uh, my first graduate degree, and I was looking at the high rates of new graduate nurse attrition. And at the time we were seeing new graduate nurses, approximately 60% of new graduate nurses leave their first place of employment within the first two years. That is huge. And I, sad to say, it's not much better now, but that is of huge cost to the organization, to the individual and to society. And my heart went out to those new graduate nurses who I remember being just like them, so excited and thrilled to have finally made it to just simply leave in less than two years and to just um, walk away from their dream. So I started looking at the 40% or the approximate 40% that didn't leave. What made them different? Why did they stick it out? And in the literature, they were described as being highly resilient over and over again. But that was it. It was just left at that. And I really became curious of what does that really mean to be resilient? Now, I had heard the term my whole life, as you probably have, but I didn't know what it really meant. And as you know, in order to measure something, we have to define it there wasn't a really good definition of resilience. In fact, there were a lot of different definitions and a lot of different views on it. Some people believed you were just born with it. Others believed it could be learned. My questions were, how, how do we develop it? What is it exactly? And can we teach it? Or are we just born with it? So that's where my work began. I immediately went into a PhD program to do those things because I found out that there wasn't a good definition and there was certainly no definition as it related to nursing students. And that's where my work first began. So before I could measure it, before I could study it and do any type of intervention to see if we could increase it, I had to, to define it. And that's where the model was born. So I developed the model of resilience based on a definition that um, I developed as part of the initial research. And that's where uh, this all began. It has since evolved and we use it with nursing professionals at all levels. I use it with nurse leaders and nursing students, all levels, but we also use it with some other clinicians as well um, because it's not rocket science. And I can say that because my son is a rocket scientist and I know that what I do is not what he does. What I'm gonna tell you tonight is probably common sense to some of you. It's putting it in action that's so important. And what I have found is that when we can break down resilience as a concept and give people tangible tools that they can use to increase their own resilience, they're able to do it. We can't just say to someone, you need to be more resilient without giving them specific instructions. And so that's what I'm going to share with you tonight at a very high level. So let's go ahead and get into this. This is how I define resilience. Now, you can see on the screen that I originally defined it in 2013. That was when the conceptual model was first published. And this was when it related specifically to nursing students. But as I said, we found that it applies to nurses at, at all levels, including nursing students and new graduates, but also for anyone that's really um, in the healthcare field. I have not tested it with people outside of the healthcare field, but many people have adopted this definition and the RN prep process um, and have found it to be effective, but I make no claims as to it being evidence-based outside of nursing or the healthcare. But it's an individualized process of development. Now, what I have in red is what I want you to really pay attention to because these words are specific 
and have deep meaning as they relate to resilience. So an individualized process means it's going to look different for each of us, depending on our circumstances, depending on our backgrounds, depending on our previous experience with stress or adversity. It's a process of development. So first process, it doesn't happen overnight. In my first study, I did an intervention study as my dissertation, and I was looking to see if uh, the intervention that I had chosen, which was delivered by Twitter, the first study in uh, nursing education research that used Twitter as an intervention delivery method. They thought I was crazy. Most people hadn't even heard of Twitter at that time. But I was delivering the intervention, and it was a multi-site study, and I wanted to see if the um, experimental group had, would have higher levels of resilience at the end of the experiment as compared to the control group. Well, we found that their resilience definitely increased over the time of the intervention. But shortly after we stopped the intervention, I used a multi-level mod model so that we could track the change over time. After we stopped the intervention, the resilience dropped back down. This was my first clue into that it is a process of development. So there's growth that occurs, but it takes time and it's going to look different for different individuals. And this is why it's so important and why there are so many uh, professional organizations that are recommending that this type of content be integrated into curricula because it needs to be a part of the process of learning. We, it takes time. It's a competency and a skill. Just like we teach skills and competencies to our students, and it's something that has to be practiced. We don't get it on the first time. We have failures. We have mess ups. But we have to give ourselves grace and give ourselves time in developing this as an essential competency. So we have to think about how it's going to look over time. We're not going to see great results. If you've ever tried to lose weight, and me, that's been a lifelong challenge of mine, you can make great changes in your diet and your exercise habits, but you may not see huge differences in a week or two, you know, even if it's showing up on the scale. But six months down the road, if you keep it up, you're going to see a difference. A year later, you're going to see a difference. It's the same with resilience. It's a process. We just have to keep doing it and taking the steps that I'm going to tell you about, about to see a difference. And when I work with different groups and different individuals, um, I often have a, a huge honor of reconnecting with them later after they've gone through the workshop or the course. And um, in fact, I just reconnected with a whole group that I was with a year ago. And to see the change in them and to hear them talk about their own change when, you know, um, over a year's time, it really does work. So this individualized process of development occurs when we use what are called personal protective factors. And these are the behaviors or characteristics that we commonly see in highly resilient individuals. These are the things that we measure if I'm doing a study and we're measuring them. And we use these, these are essentially coping strategies to deal with or cope with stress or trauma or adversity in our life. The good part about this is that there are cumulative successes. Again, this is part of building that competence or building that skill of resilience that over time, as we succeed each time in doing this, and we make better choices of how we're going to respond to the stress or the adversity in that moment, we get better at it. Not only for that time, but for future stressors and future challenges in life. And the beauty of all of this is that not only does it help us better cope with the challenges that we face in life, it brings about an enhanced sense of well-being overall. This is why resilience is mentioned so much in any type of strategy or interventions or programs that are designed to improve well-being in individuals. These are a list of the personal protective factors that we see most commonly in very highly resilient individuals. And I'm not going to go into each of these individual. There are lists that you can have. If you, if you send me an email, I'll share my email with you at the end of the program. Um, I'm happy to share those with you and a list of how you can do a little self-assessment 
self-assessment. But if I were to be there with you in person or if we were having a conversation and I asked you to describe a highly resilient individual, you would probably mention some of these things. These are the tools in our toolbox when we're highly resilient. And these are the things that we rely on during times of stress or adversity. So the goal is to develop as many of these or to enhance as many of these as possible. Now, as I was studying resilience and, and developing the conceptual model, most of my work or all of my work at that time, I should say, was quantitative in nature. I was a quantitative researcher. I liked the numbers. I liked data. I liked doing experimental studies. Um, and so I understood the concept from that perspective. But some things happened in my own life in the midst of the early phases of research that made me recognize that I really need to, needed to understand it from a personal perspective, from a human perspective. In fact, I was forced to start living out my own research. Um, up until this point in my life, I had had some challenges, but nothing extreme. Um, and uh, on Christmas Eve, uh, one year, we became homeless. We lost our home and everything we owned, including our dog in a tragic house fire. And we were uh, faced with, no we had nothing except what we were wearing. And I learned then that uh, I had to really redefine myself. I had defined myself by things a lot of the time. And so it was very humbling in having to rely on other people to give us a place to live, to provide basic needs. Um, and all of those things. And so I really had to start reflecting on those protective factors as they applied to me and to my family. A few years after that, not that long after that, um, my husband experienced a massive heart attack and we weren't sure he was going to survive. And he was only 49 at the time, we thought in great health. Um, and it was a very scary time. And I really had to reframe my own perspective on what really mattered to me. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Shortly after that, I changed jobs so that I could be closer to home. I was traveling a lot at that time. And I took a, an administrative position um, in a program where I experienced extreme levels of moral distress that progressed to moral injury. Um, and this, I would have to say, was probably one of the most challenging things I have ever faced. And it has greatly informed my work. And it's part of the resilience process where I can say I grew because of those challenges. And, and it's really informed the work I do now because many other nurses face these same things. You've probably read about moral distress. I have uh, two research studies right now that are in press looking at moral distress in faculty. Um, but these, this is where my research took a turn, and I recognized that I needed to incorporate some qualitative work in this to really understand how do highly resilient individuals think? How do they respond in the midst of these experiences? So I turned to a group of individuals who, to me, were superheroes of resilience. In fact, that's what I call them now. And these are Holocaust survivors. I grew up, um, I'm not Jewish, um, but my family uh, was very close to um, some Jewish families. And my mother was um, a member of the Holocaust uh, Museum in Chicago. And we, I grew up hearing about the Holocaust and uh, learning about the Holocaust. So I reached out to some connections and became involved with the United States Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum, as well as some state Holocaust organizations. And through that, I was able to interact with and meet and get to know quite a few um, Holocaust survivors who have become like members of my own family. And through their genuine kindness and compassion and uh, generosity. They have shared their stories with me over the past uh, decade and a half. And in fact, I developed a program called Holocaust Whispers, Lessons in Resilience, because their 
experiences and their willingness to share those with me is what truly led to the work that I do now. It allowed all those protective factors that I was studying to take a human tone and to become people so that I could really teach this. And in fact, they, you know, they shared their stories with me knowing that it was my goal to be able to teach these skills and these behaviors to nurses and other healthcare professionals. And I'm forever grateful to them. And so I share their photos with you now um, because they are uh, very special to me. This is only a few of them. Some of them have passed away um, in the past couple of years, but I'm forever grateful to them. And so I do want to honor them with that. What I learned from them that resilience is a mindset. And it really is a shift in perspective for many of us. There are people who are more naturally highly resilient. You probably know them. They just seem unfazed by the challenges in life. But we can all learn it. That is one thing that the research shows is that everyone can increase their personal resilience. Um, it's a choice. It's not going to be easy. It doesn't mean that you won't experience stress or um, fear or pain during those times of trauma. We all experience that, but it's what we choose to do with it. And that comes from this resilient mindset. And what that allows us to do is move from a victim mentality to a victor. And that is one of the greatest things that I've learned from these stories is that it, it was a the perseverance to keep on and to know that we can be victorious and overcome these challenges instead of giving in. So all of the protective factors, as I was gathering these stories and these narratives and learning from all of these individuals, they started to just kind of um, develop into these themes. I kept seeing these same four themes over and over and over again. And then when I was looking at other people, and I've worked with um, a nursing school in Haiti for a while, and, and when I would go to Haiti, I would just see the challenges that these nursing students faced. And it was, you know, especially after the earthquake, um, I saw the same themes. I had, my best friend went through cancer. Um, and as I would go with her to her chemo treatments, I saw these same four themes emerge. Um, and so it started making sense to me that this is what it is to be highly resilient. All of those personal protective factors overlap and fall into these four different categories, purpose, priorities, perspective, and personal responsibility. Again, you're seeing the tree. So let's look at purpose first. And you probably have seen, especially if you work in healthcare, I'm sure you have um, seen or heard people talk about the importance of identifying your purpose. And Viktor Frankl is one of my favorite authors. Um, he was a Holocaust survivor. He was a, a physician and a, a psychotherapist. He lost his wife in the camps. And while he was in the camps during the Holocaust, he wrote the draft of a manuscript called Man's Search for Meaning. And after he was liberated and went on to continue his career as a physician, he published this work. Um, I read this at least once a year. If you have not read it, I highly encourage you to read it. Um, and he, he specifically focused on purpose and how having a sense of purpose can get us through the toughest times in our life. Um, he, you have a quote here from that book that he said, for the meaning of life differs from man to man or from woman to woman, from day to day and from hour to hour. What matters, therefore, is not the meaning of life in general, but rather the specific meaning of a person's life at a given moment. And this means that when we are in the midst of something that <clears throat> is stressful, tragic, however you look at it, you're perceiving it as bad. If we have a purpose that can help us get through that and push us forward. Um, and you can see where many of those protective factors fall into that hope, um, perseverance, positive emotions, all of those things play into purpose. I saw this live out um, very specifically in one of the survivors that I worked with. And you see a photo of her here on the right with her twin sister. This was Eva Kaur. You all may have heard of Eva Kaur. She uh, 
developed the Candles uh, Museum in Terre Haute. But Eva and her twin sister, Miriam, were part of the Mengele twins. Those horrible um, experiments that were done on twins during uh, the Holocaust. Eva is the one on the left. And she was actually the experimental twin. She is the one that I knew. Her sister, twin sister, Miriam, was the control group twin that was left behind to be observed um, to see what her reaction would be to the experiments that were done on Eva. And you can see there were very young children um, at this time. This was the day of liberation. If you were to span out on this photo, you would see that one of the Red Cross nurses was leading them out of the camp. But when I would be interviewing Eva, and she has passed on. Um, but when I would interview Eva, I just couldn't imagine that as a young child, she was able to survive the horrific things that she went through. And I was talking to her about that one day. How do you get through that from day to day? And she described very, very eloquently how her life was, she was kept in, in a hospital area of, the, of Auschwitz. And they would take her out on a gurney in the morning. And that was the only time that she saw outside. So she would travel from the barracks that she was kept in with Miriam and the other twins to outside to this hospital setting. It wasn't really a hospital. It's where they did the experiment. So it wasn't any type of humane hospital like we would imagine. And she said that she would look up um, because that was the only time she was able to see outside. And one day she said that she looked up and she saw a, an airplane fly over with an American flag. And she realized then that this was not all there was and that there was something else out there that, that gave her hope and that she had a reason to live because of Miriam and she had to survive it to get to that day when this would all end so that Miriam could live. Miriam was her purpose. And she, she would jokingly say, Miriam would not have survived without me because I was stronger than her, even though she was the one having the experiments done to her. Eva was a spitfire, I will tell you. Um, but her purpose to live, her will to live became her sister. And she credits that with getting her through some of the worst times. Now, hopefully none of us will ever face something like that, but purpose is extremely important in our life, but also in our work. And this is where I spend my time talking about purpose with nurses and nursing students. We have our big purpose, which is a purpose in life, which is a huge philosophical discussion that we won't have tonight. Uh, but I encourage you to question that and to think about that as an individual. What I talk about is our work purpose, our career purpose, which never should be our life purpose. It can be part of that, but we should never let it become everything to us. But it is important that we find meaning in our work. And that's not just fluff. That is based on research and evidence. I call it our North Star. It's what guides us. It's what draws us to our profession. It's where we find meaning in our work. And Damon et al. described this as a stable and generalized intention to accomplish something that is at once meaningful to the self and of consequence to the world beyond the self. So as nurses and as healthcare professionals, many of us enter this profession because we want to help others. So it's a very outward mindset type of profession. We want to serve others, but that's what gives meaning to us. And this is that sense of purpose. We feel fulfilled. We, we find meaning in helping others. So we get fulfillment out of that. The stable part is that it doesn't change that much over the course of our career. What draws us to this work pretty much stays with us. And what I've found when working with um, executives or leaders who have been in nursing or healthcare for a long time, and they've gotten further and further away from where they started, they may have achieved great heights, great success, but they're fully burned out or just extremely distressed in their current job. It's because they don't have that sense of meaning or purpose anymore in the work. What they do is not meaningful to them any longer. So it's important and it is, is of critical importance if we're going to mitigate our risk 
for burnout and moral distress that we maintain at least some level of our work that is meaningful to us. And the 20% is key here. Recent evidence, recent research shows that for healthcare professionals, if we are able to have meaningful work a minimum of 20% of the time, we can greatly reduce our risk for burnout. Now, 20% is not that much. No job is going to be 100% meaningful. And if you were hoping for that, I'm sorry to shatter your illusions tonight. It, there's going to be drudgery in every job. That's just part of life. What we can do is be very intentional in the jobs that we choose, in the roles that we take. And this is something that I stress with nursing students. Think about this. Be very intentional and look at the job itself. What will you be doing? What does the work look like? And will I be able to find meaning in that work at least part of the time, aiming for 20%? In my recent study, I explored nursing faculty resilience, purpose, and moral courage. And in this study, huge results. It's in press right now. I can't wait for you all to read it. I had 690 participants, which I was pretty excited about that sample size we found that there were correlations between all three. Now, what I want you to look at is the presence subscale of purpose, meaning in life, Me when I was measuring it according to work. There's two subscales when we measure purpose. One is seeking purpose. The other is that it's presence. And they have opposite effects. If you're just seeking a purpose in your life or in your work, there's higher levels of depression, anxiety, and dissatisfaction and engagement with work. If, you, if it is presence and you know your purpose, you know what it is, you've named it, there are great benefits in that. This is what's related to resilience. This is where you have greater satisfaction, you're, you have more professional fulfillment, less anxiety, less distress, all of those positive benefits of knowing what is meaningful to you in your work. So what matters to you matters. And it's important that you identify that. The second P are priorities. And this goes hand in hand with purpose. It's what matters to you in your life and your core values. So this photograph I took at uh, Terrazin or the Theresienstadt concentration camp and one of the survivors that I work with, and she's just like a member of my family, um, absolutely love her. She actually lives in New York. She lives in Queens. Um, she was the youngest child survivor of the Theresienstadt concentration camp just outside of Prague. And the last time I went over, she asked if I would visit her bunk and take some pictures for her because it had been a while since she went there. So while I was there, this was the processing room, and it's pretty much been left the way it was at um, the time of liberation. And I had some time to stay in there quietly by myself, and I took these photos. And if you were to see the, if I were to span the room, you would see that this one whole room was just lined with luggage and personal belongings, all, all of the walls and all along the floor. And as I stood there, I, I thought to myself, if, if I were leaving and going to a strange place, and I didn't know where I was going or how long I would be there, what would I take with me? Now, those survivors, those um, people that were going to those camps often didn't know where they were going, and they had 24 or 48 hours to gather what they could take, usually what they were able to carry. So for the children, it was usually within a pillowcase. But when I do this in my workshops, I ask people, yeah, don't limit them to what they can carry. I just say, think about what would be five things. If you only could take five things with you, what would you take or five people? That's what matters to you. Often what we find with nurses and other healthcare professionals, especially now since the pandemic, when moral distress is so high and we have such problems with staffing and workload and just lots of issues in the work environment, that we become consumed with the stress of work and we lose sight of what really matters to us. Now, our jobs matter to us, but like I said, that shouldn't be the full purpose in our life. 
And the further we get away from our priorities and we start to just give the scraps of our best to our true priorities, our family, our friends, our loved ones, we become very resentful. We become very angry. And that's the true path to burnout. We have to be willing to establish some boundaries in our lives in order to protect what matters to us. And this is part of the resilience process in understanding that it, that what matters to us matters, our purpose matters in our work and in our life, but also those people and those things, our physical health, our relationships, maybe your faith, um, your pets, whatever it is, we have to make time for that and not let that constantly just be shoved to the side. The other thing that's part of our priorities are our core values, and this is very important for nurses, especially when you're considering a job. Not only should it align with your purpose, what's meaningful to you, but look at the values of that organization. Are they consistent with your own core values? Ideally, every organization that you could go to work for is going to have a mission, vision, and value statement that should drive everything that they do. All within all of the individual subsets of that organization, so your school or college of nursing, their mission, vision, and values should reflect that of the parent organization. So when we think about going to work for a place, we need to be very self-aware, understand what our core values are, and are they going to be consistent there? If not, if there's an inconsistency there, we're just putting ourselves at risk for moral distress and for burnout. So this resilient mindset leads us to make better choices and better decisions that truly mitigate our risk for some of these negative outcomes. And prevention is the word. Prevention is key in uh, for nurses at all levels now. I like this quote by Jay Kaplan that says, burnout comes from a loss of connection to our patients, to ourselves, and to those we love. And for faculty, it can be a loss of connection to our students when we are distracted by all of the other things. Too often in healthcare today, we focus on tasks, on doing the appropriate tests and making the right diagnosis. When what our patients and students want, what we truly crave is to feel connected. We have to maintain those connections. Relationships are so important. And to do that, we have to set boundaries. And this is something we don't do very well as nurses. We have never done well with setting boundaries, but it is an essential competency, in my opinion, that we have to establish some healthy boundaries with our own time, with our energy, with our resources, in order to truly embrace that resilient mindset. And it makes us better. It's like putting on the oxygen mask if you're in a plane and they talk about if you're traveling with a small child and the oxygen masks drop, you're to put yours on first. That's what resilience is. We're taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others because we're no good if we're burned out. The third P is perspective. And the goal is to develop a diverse and informed perspective. Often when we're extremely stressed, we get a very narrow focus that the um, overload of the stress hormones that are just flowing throughout our body can take over our brain and we don't think clearly. So it's important that we understand that, what is happening to us and that we need to step back to see the big picture, to see the facts. Because as Thoreau said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. We want to see the big picture all the time, but especially during times of stress or adversity. And, and really step back and refocus while we are in the moment so we can make better de- decisions. Now, if you are a nursing student or, or a nursing professional or a healthcare professional and you've had pathophysiology, you're going to recognize this. This is the stress response in action. We get some sort of stimuli or a trigger that our brain senses as something that we need to react to. So there's an alarm that goes off in our brain. And almost immediately, those stress hormones are just invading our entire body. So the stress response isn't limited to our brain. We feel it everywhere. And everybody responds differently to that. But there are body-wide changes. I tend to get this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. My heart rate increases. Um, A lot of people get headaches. 
um, you need to know what your response is because that's a red flag. And that is a sign that we need to reframe our perspective. Okay, the minute we get that sensation, that fight, flight, or freeze urge, that's our warning sign that we need to step back unless it's a true emergency. Now, there are times that we have true emergencies. I haven't found many in academia, maybe one or two when someone had a medical emergency, but most of the time we have a chance to pause and put the situation into perspective. The first step in that is self-awareness. That is where you name what you're feeling. Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it worry? And really start to think about what is going on here. What caused this? How have I handled this in the past? And what message do I need to send to my brain? This is where we win the war. The mindset war is when we tell our brain to take a chill pill and to pause and, and realize that feelings aren't always facts. We can't always trust our emotions. The second step, <coughs> excuse me, is situational awareness. Once we've gotten some control over our emotions, we need to gather information beyond what we just think we know. We never know it all. And oftentimes, if we react, we're going to get into further trouble. A resilient mindset moves us from a knee-jerk reaction to an informed response. And that's through an informed perspective. So we need to think about the situation. What are its effects going to be? This is a lot like clinical judgment in nursing, right? If you're learning about that. So not only what are the potential effects right now, but future effects. If I do this, what may happen next? Another Viktor Frankl quote that I absolutely love, and he talks about this, where we take that pause when we are in the midst of something really stressful, that between the stimulus, that's whatever has triggered that stress response in us and how we respond. So between the trigger and our response, there's a space. That's our pause. And when we take advantage of that space, that's where we regain control and power because only we can choose our response to stress. No one can take that away from us. We regain control. And oftentimes when I'm working with people who are experiencing extreme moral distress or burnout, and I remember when I experienced it, you feel absolutely out of control, that there, you have no control over your situation. When you pause and you take a deep breath and you think, you regain that control. And that's where we grow and re, we regain that freedom in our lives and we don't feel trapped any longer. These are just some questions that I've developed and for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but this is part of the pause and just gathering information and gathering the facts about what's really happening here and determine, does it even matter? And if it does matter, what do I need to do about this? Do I need to act right now or can I wait until the future? So if you remember the story I told you a few moments ago about Eva, when she would be taken from the barracks, this is the, this is that barracks that I was talking about. And I took this um, when I was in Auschwitz and the, you see the little H over on the left of the screen that, that signified that this was the hospital setting. So this was where she would be going in. And um, this was that outside path between her barracks and going in here to where she looked up. Now, if, on that gurney, all she was able to see if she just looked around her would be these buildings and these chimneys. Very bleak, right? That's all she saw every day. But she looked up and she looked beyond what was immediately in front of her and reframed her perspective in order to get, regain hope and to regain that will to live and to persevere. And that's what reframing our perspective does. So a few weeks ago, I was uh, doing my morning walk and we live part time on the Isle of Palms in South Carolina and a bad storm came up. And um, this was what I saw. I was on the edge of the water and this huge storm came down and I looked out and I saw this little fishing boat out there and I thought, oh, my gosh, they are right in the middle of this. And so from their perspective. I imagine it was very bleak. It was a small fishing boat, little shrimp boat. Um, and then 
I, I was looking at them and I was thinking about, you know, how bad I was feeling in that moment, how bad it must have felt for them. And from their perspective, they were probably wondering what they were going to do. I stepped back and spanned and just kind of scanned the situation. And this is what I saw. I could see that they weren't far from getting out of that storm. And if they could have that perspective, I'm sure they would feel much better. But this is how we are many times in our situation. We only see the dark and the bleak. We don't see that just right beyond that hill is sunshine. If we can just persevere and just keep going, we're going to be out of that storm. So I call this hope. Um, and to me, this really demonstrates how we need to look beyond the immediate moment and reframe our perspective to really realize, and hope is one of the most power protective factors we can have, especially when we're going through serious challenges in our life, that we just keep going just a little bit further and we're gonna see that light. The final P is personal responsibility. Um, and this has to do with accountability at all levels. We're accountable to ourselves, but we're also accountable to others. And I do a lot of work on building resilient teams and um, it's very important that we understand that we have responsibilities for our own personal resilience, but also if we're in the healthcare professions in modeling these behaviors and teaching them to others. This photograph I also took in the uh, Theresa Stott concentration camp, which was used as a propaganda station during the war to demonstrate that there were human, humane activities going on within the concentration camps. And so they did some cleanup and they put in these latrines to um, show the International Red Cross when they came in that it wasn't near as bad as what they were hearing. What happened though, is that when they came to inspect and they were hearing the story about, um, you know, that these were all lies that were being told outside of the area and that really the people were being treated very well. Not one inspector went over and tested these sinks. There was no plumbing. If they had, if one person had done that, they would have saved hundreds and hundreds of lives because as soon as those inspectors left, all of those prisoners were sent to the gas chambers. We're accountable for our actions. And, and we have to recognize that, especially if we're in leadership roles, that we have to be willing to stand up and speak out. And within healthcare, we're facing a lot of challenges right now. A lot of change has happened and is needed to still happen. We're facing in nursing academia, huge changes coming up. We have next gen starting in April. If you um, are CCNE accredited, we have the new essentials. There's a lot of other recommendations um, with curriculum changes, with leadership model style changing, all kinds of things. And we're experiencing a lot of growing pains. We have to be accountable to ourselves to being willing to change our own minds about long held traditions, about precedent, um, about how we do things. And we're accountable for that because change is inevitable. It's how we change that is going to really determine our future. Personal resilience is an ethical responsibility. So we know that it's something that we should be teaching and something that we should be developing in ourselves and in our learners um, and in, in nursing all across the board. But did you know that it's actually part of our code of ethics? So if we look at provision five in the code of ethics, uh, the American code of ethics, it says that the nurse owes the same duties to self as to others, including the responsibility to promote health and safety, preserve wholeness of character and integrity, maintain competence, and continue personal and professional growth. That's resilience right there. So it's not just a nice thing to do. We have an ethical responsibility to ourselves and to our learners. And um, if you're a preceptor to those you're serving to model resilient behaviors. Not only did the uh, American Code of Ethics um, speak to this, but late last year, just before the holidays, the International Council for Nurses revised the International Code of Ethics for Nurses to specifically reflect these elements of resilience and well-being. 
specific to what we have seen happen due to COVID in the work environment related to nurses. And this is just one example. There are many other examples within this International Code of Ethics that speak to work-life balance, ongoing personal growth and development, healthy lifestyle, healthy work conditions, safe staffing, all of these things that we are advocating for. We now have the backing that it's an ethical responsibility. And we're seeing more and more organizations embrace these and more and more regulatory bodies saying it's essential to integrate resilience content and well-being content into the curriculum, um, into nurse residency programs. Uh, Joint Commission is looking at these, all of these different things for the work environment. So we're making great progress and I have great hope. You know, chaos often brings effective change. And we've seen many many bad things because of the pandemic, but there are some good things that have come from the pandemic. We're seeing rapid change where we have really struggled with change in the nursing profession for a long time. We, we don't do really well with change, um, but we've been forced to change. And this is one of the areas that has come about as a result of this. And I have great hope for our future um, in our profession. One of the things that we're doing is redefining what it means to be a good nurse. And um, we're, we're, we're looking at a whole new generation of nurses who are coming along that um, really look different, act different, and it's very much needed. We know that um, many of these behaviors and characteristics are necessary in the practice setting to increase quality and safety. And they defy much of what has been traditional in nursing. So if you look on the left side, um, I, I speak of the tyranny of precedent and Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, actually coined that phrase when she talked about how precedent can be a tyrant in many cultures. It, it keeps us from progressive change and innovation. Um, and many of the myths and folklore you see on the left side are, have been part of our culture of nursing, where nurses were quiet and obedient and subservient and always followed the rules, never questioned authority, um, self-sacrificing and nice. And that's what's led to the problems that we have now. You can still be nice and be a thinker and be an innovator and challenge some of these myths and folklore. That's what I mean by redefining what it means to be a good nurse. The reality is that a good nurse is someone who demonstrates moral courage. And that means standing up and speaking out against injustices. And that's one of the things that I've learned from my work with the Holocaust. We must speak out and advocate for the vulnerable, including our students and including other nurses and including any group or um, population that is subject to injustice. This includes intelligent disobedience. If you haven't heard of that term, I encourage you to look it up. Human-centered leadership, loyalty to personal values and ethics, not just to a, a person or an organization, and that we are willing to be advocates for ourselves as well as to others. So resilience is personal growth and development. It's an opportunity to grow through adversity and through challenges. It is a choice. Not everyone will choose that. It's hard. Um, I, it, highly resilient individuals struggle just like the rest of us do. And change is never easy. Um, and often we have to change ourselves first. And it requires changing our minds about some things. So a lot of people will not choose to go the path of increased resilience. Remember, it's a process. It takes time. So don't give up. If you choose to do that, I encourage you and I'm behind you 100%. Don't give up. It works. And it is contextual. There will be ebbs and flows in our levels of resilience. And we're not perfect. We're human. We're going to have down times in our life. And that's okay. The important thing is to be like Babe Ruth and just get back up. Sometimes resilience is resisting the status quo. And it is individual as well as collective. And it, if we're going to change the culture of nursing and healthcare, it's going to require resilient teams who come together with resilient individuals to build those resilient teams that build a resilient culture. So what's next in all of this work? Um, I do believe we're at the tipping point of real change in 
practice in academia. Um, I, like I said, I've been exploring this for a long time, almost two decades. And for the first time, I really believe we're at the tipping point. And a lot of this has come about in the past two and a half years because of the chaos we've experienced. Um, we're, we're really moving more towards evidence-based practice in pr academia as well as in practice. There's been a generational shift. We see new leaders coming in who really embrace new models of work and um, really value um, the things that resilience um, in, involves. Higher education is, is going through a revolution and an evolution at a very fast rate. And there's a lot of things changing and it's going to be those resilient cultures, those resilient organizations that come through um, with like a shining star that are able to not just survive the chaos, but truly thrive. So again, there's opportunity in the chaos. Um, a lot of grassroots efforts I see, and a lot of this is related to what I'm doing. I see nursing students <coughs> all across the world um, being self-directed and taking responsibility for their own resilience and adopting these strategies and teaching them to each other, not waiting on someone to give them permission to do that. And again, like I mentioned, there are regulatory requirements um, that are, are coming into play that are going to force it for those organizations who haven't done it on their own. Systems and situations change only when we change. We have to change our own minds first. And then when we change, that's when the systems start to change. So it begins with us. And as Viktor Frankl said, another one of his quotes, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And we do have the ability to change our situation, fortunately, but we're, we are going to have to change ourselves. We have to change um, in order to create this new culture within healthcare. And it begins with our resilient mindsets. Each of us has that personal responsibility for shifting, and that's going to depend on where you are in this process. Um, and it may, it's going to be harder for some than it is for others. But I love this quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens, that's us, can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And with that, this uh, is where I'm headed next. Uh, the, the program that I developed as all of this, um, based on this work is called RN Prep, uh, Personal Resilience Enhancement Plan. And part of my, um, part in this big work. And I, as Mother Teresa said, I can't change the world alone, but I can cast a stone that creates little ripples. And in, as I'm creating ripples um, in changing the culture of nursing and healthcare, this uh, program will be launching in January. Um, and that's the next big step in this work. So it will be going to a fully virtual online course for nursing students, new graduate nurses and nursing professionals so that it can reach more people. Um, and hopefully then they can take it and impact the lives of many others. So um, it's, it's been a, a, an exciting journey for me and uh, one that I'm excited to continue. And um, I just wanna say thank you for letting me share my journey with you and um, to be a part of this very special event. My email address is on the screen if you want um, any information that I've shared or if you just wanna reach out, I'd love to hear from you. And I wish you all the best um, in your own personal journeys and um, the best uh, with President Riesberg and his new uh, journey. You all, I, I think, have some great uh, things coming up for Hartwick just from what I've been able to gather and um, I hope one day to be able to visit you in person. So I'm going to turn it over to um, the hosts now and um, stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. I'm a little wow. A little that's quite extraordinary and and looping in the Holocaust to fortify your points is, is so powerful. Uh, I encourage our audience to put your questions in the Q&A and I will get to those. They are starting to fill in. But before we do that, I do have an important announcement to make that 
is extraordinarily generous, Dr. Stevens has offered the course that she just spoke about, her RN prep course, Personal Resilience Enhancement Plan, that goes um, live in January. She has offered that to all the nursing students and faculty here at Hartwood College uh, that as a gift to us, which we are overwhelmed with gratitude. And just your pre presentation has been such an incredible thing this evening. And I think um, that generous offer will only, only help enhance and get your message, start the ripples here in Oneonta. So my pleasure. I cannot wait to have you all join me in the class. I'm excited. Uh, I will be there. Great. Thank you so much for that. Let's get to some questions from um, our audience tonight. Uh, one of our professors, Maya McCann, asks, can, if you could recommend a short exercise that could be done with students at the beginning or end of class to help build on some of these resilience skills. Yes, there's so many, but I'll tell you one that um, really uh, has resonated with me and that I have found my students really enjoy doing. Now, one of the things that I do with all of my students is has the, have them create their own purpose statement. Now, that takes a little bit longer than something at the beginning of class, but this that is something that I think is very important. And I ask faculty to do it as well, and everyone share that who's willing to share that. But one thing that I do, um, if I just want to do something, if I if I really pick up on there's there's a lot of anxiety or stress, maybe we have something that's going on that's um, heightened emotions, those types of things. I will just ask everyone to pause and to find a partner in the classroom or get into a small group and to think about someone in their life that is a, a priority for them, someone that they just love. And to spend one minute describing that person to them. And it, the shift in the room is, is almost immediate because people are laughing, they're smiling, and their mind, it's, it's a practice in perspective shift. If you've studied psychology, you know that that's one of the strategies we do. We move our mind from one thing to another. So asking them to focus, just describing that individual, because social support is one of the most important protective factors that we have and that I've found in nurses. And the question that I ask is, who is there for you no matter what? And then I ask them to describe that person. And that's just a very small little exercise. It can greatly lower the stress level. It gets people um, in a completely different mindset. So that's the one that I would recommend if you need something in a hurry, that's something quick and easy to do and that they really enjoy. Or you can ask them to write it down if you don't want them to have to share that verbally, to write it down and share it with someone else. Nice. That's a good exercise for all of us. A little yes, it is. gratitude too. Yes, it uh, so is. One of our junior students, Kelly Jo, Yay! is asking, what was your motivation to start your nursing journey? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I'll tell you, I started out pre-med. My dad had this dream that I would be a pediatrician. Now, I don't know where that came from, but that was, that was it. So I got a full scholarship um, as a chemistry major, went full pre-med, and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. Um, and I just, I don't, I, I really didn't have a lot of wisdom around that. I didn't no really any nurses, but I had something in me that had me look at the nursing model. And I recognized that was more me than the medical model at that time. Now, again, this was 1982. <laughs> so I just um, did not see myself doing that. I really liked the nursing model. And so once I got into nursing school, I just knew it was the right fit. You know, if you, when you find it, it was just who I was. Um, and I knew I was in the right place. So it really, a lot of it was serendipitous. Um, but uh, I, I guess a lot of it came from knowing what I didn't like, but that I knew I wanted something in healthcare. So I'm just very grateful that I made the right choice uh, without a very good informed perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little lucky there too. I maybe. did get lucky. I did. Yes. <laughs> That's a lot help. Uh, this is another junior nursing student and, and she touches upon a question about the pandemic, which there are a couple questions. 
Have you noticed any changes, positive or negative, in the resilience of nurses after the pandemic? Yeah, um, it's really interesting. Uh, there's, I've written a blog and uh, it'll be coming out soon. I'll be doing it on the podcast too. I talk about the weaponization of resilience. And um, sadly, there have been, uh, there's become a distaste in some organizations where um, maybe it's not a healthy culture and uh, nurses have felt that resilience has been used against them, that it's been, uh, you may have seen on the slide that it was a victimization type of thing or victim blaming. Um, so there, there's been an element of that, but for the most part, I think overwhelmingly nurses recognize how resilient they are. And prior to the pandemic, when we measured nurses, they were always pretty high on resilience. Um, and physicians as well, too. They would, when we would measure them we're using the scales. But what we found that has changed in the pandemic is prior to the pandemic, when we talked about resilience, it was about acute stressors, those challenges that would just come up that were temporary. Burnout, which is one of the big hot topics, is chronic stress. And so we've had to really reframe, and I've really reframed how I teach this in the workshop and looking at chronic stress because. We want to advocate for change. We're definitely pushing for change. We know change has to come, but it's not going to be immediate. It's not going to be relieved immediately. We still have a lot to go through. And so I teach resilience in a different way because of the pandemic. And that's where I'm trying to help these nurses shift their mindset that, yes, you are absolutely resilient, but we've really got to dig in and be much more intentional in how we approach stress because we're in this for the long haul for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. This is another student question. And actually a couple of these juniors have asked the same question and worded a little different, but they're both asking you, uh, you mentioned about setting boundaries in nursing and the profession and how as new nurses, do you have any tips to have how they could set those boundaries? Yes, and it's difficult. I think part of it is mitigating risk at the beginning. And, you know, when I talk to a lot of people um, who are in really bad situations and unable to set any type of healthy boundary, they have taken a job without considering where they fit. And if it is a good fit, you know, we're not meant to fit everywhere. And my personal values, my uh purpose and all of that is going to be very different from maybe yours. And so I can't take a position just because I love that kind of work. I need to look at the big picture. That's the informed perspective of that. And really thinking about what does the work really look like here? What are the hours? What are the expectations? What's the culture like? And so looking at all of those things before you make a decision can mitigate your risk. Now, once you're in that decision, or in that job and you've already you know, taken that and you're in a position, there are strategies that we can do to establish healthy boundaries. And it's a process as well. And really looking at, um, are we making assumptions? I find uh, this was my problem. I assumed I could not set boundaries just because I thought that's what it was. But when I actually explored it and talked about it and had some healthy, crucial conversations, I found that there weren't rules against some of the boundaries. You know, we don't have to answer email every hour or we don't have to say yes to all of these things. But often in nursing, we feel pressure to say yes to everything. And that's on us. So that's that personal accountability and that personal responsibility. Sometimes we have to change our own minds and really look at the facts and then deal with what the situation is. And often it's not near as bad as what we think it is. So, you know, clarify expectations is the one thing I would say. Go to the source. Don't just take um, secondhand knowledge or hearsay or rumors um, and make decisions based on that. I have seen so many people make bad decisions or get overwhelmed with stress because they didn't verify information. They'll, they'll say, well, so-and-so said that's the way it's supposed to be. We can't do that. 
we have to verify and we have to think things through. Um, and often I find that just by clarifying expectations, that will allow us to regain some of that control and set healthy boundaries. So if you're struggling with boundaries as a student or as um, a, a licensed nurse, find out who has the answers or where the answers are, clarify the facts first, and then have a conversation about that. Now, as a student and um, in, in certain settings, there's going to be times that we don't have balance. OK, that's just part of, you know, the sacrifice of taking on some additional responsibilities. When we take on something, something's going to give somewhere. The goal is that we don't live in that forever. You know, if you've ever walk, watched someone on, walk a tightrope, you know, they've got that bar, that handle they hold on to. And so it's constant adjustment from side to side. That's life. We're constantly adjusting. So there may be times as a student that you don't have a lot of home life or personal balance, but it shouldn't be that way every day. You may have to cut out some time wasters, time eaters. Really look at what you do with your time to make time for the true priorities. So for me, um, you know, my health suffered during COVID. I gained a lot of weight. And I knew I needed to prioritize my health in order to regain that. So I, I'm busy, like all of you all are. I had to cut out some things to prioritize that. So some of it's on us, but there's also things that we need to say no to and set some boundaries with. And so clarifying expectations and then realizing, you know, that we have some responsibility in that as well. I, you know, I prioritize exercise. So I've had to put that into my day um, in order to make sure that every day that I get that and, you know, it, it, it will pay off. Um, but that's the hard part about it. That's the growing pains. And that's the challenge of changing our behaviors and our mindset. Mm -hmm. There's some really great resources. In fact, I'm going to be doing a webinar next year on setting boundaries, uh, professional boundaries. And so, um, if you follow along with my step, you'll, you'll see that I'm, I'm doing that with a nurse anesthetist and we do a lot of work together on setting boundaries. Very good. Very good. Uh, another question for you. Is it more common for people later in life to focus more on life instead of their career purposes? And if so, do they still need 20% work satisfaction to avoid burnout? Later Great in question. Great question. Let me answer the second one first. That's we don't have that research yet. Um, th this is relatively new research. I think 2020, late 2019, 2020 was when that first study was published. So we haven't gone that deep into looking at how it changes over generations. But what we do know is that and this is one thing that I've learned in my research that is very um, applicable. Remember when I talked about purpose and I said it's a stable or generalized intention that stays with us pretty much our entire careers, that what drives us to our profession or gives us meaning in our work remains with us over time? Priorities don't. Priorities shift as we go through life. So that is the change that happens that will, uh, and also wisdom, we gain wisdom and our perspective is enlarged just because of life experiences. That's where that shift in priorities come, where we may not be willing to work 24 hours. There's also a generational shift in that, in that the younger generations coming along um, have a much healthier outlook on life. You know, I'm a boomer. And so I grew up with where you were really praised. You get a badge of honor if you give 100% to work, you know, and sacrifice everything else. That's how I grew up. I mean, I grew up, um, you know, a grandchild of a coal miner, you know, and, and my dad was went through that. And so, you know, work, if you gave it all to work and you were a workaholic, that's what was prized. That's not right. And so younger generations have a better perspective on that and are much better at setting boundaries. But as we've gotten older and as your priorities shift, <clears throat> you feel that inside. And this is where we see a lot of nurses that are my age and older experiencing high levels of moral distress. They don't feel they can set those boundaries any longer because they never have. Mm 
They've given everything to work for so long, they don't know to where even to begin to develop a life outside of work, which is very, very sad. And I work with a lot of people like that. Um, but inside they want to because their priorities have shifted. So, you know, that's a that's a part of that informed perspective is rec that self-awareness that I talked about is knowing who you are and where you are in life and what matters to you at this point, which will inform the decisions that you make. Um, I've pulled back on a lot of things because I'm a grandmother now, as she mentioned at the beginning, I really cherish that time. They don't live near me. So I want to be able to go and visit them and spend time with them. So, you know, I have pulled away some from that because my priorities have shifted. Those were great questions. Yes. Great questions. I, I've got some more if you're up for okay, it. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. This is a good one um, from Scout, one of our, uh, she's a senior now. Um, do you find that a nurse must reach a point of moral distress before they develop a greater sense of resilience? Do we have to break first or? No, 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 absolutely not. In fact, I'm so glad you asked that. <clears throat> That's the whole purpose of everything that I'm doing is to prevent that. You can prevent it. You can mitigate your risk for moral distress and burnout. It is not a given. You do not have to experience that. And that's where this all started all those years ago when I made myself that promise is how do we teach people to learn these skills before they ever get there? It, prevention is better than a cure. You learn that as a nursing student, right? We want to promote health and well-being. It's much easier to prevent something than it is to cure it. That's what this is all about. Now you're going to experience stress and, you know, moral distress comes with the job. There are ethical dilemmas whenever we experience that, but moral injury is not a given and small doses of moral distress. Resilience will get you through that, but you will have the skills and the mindset to understand what, what is happening and how to respond to that. And that's with the moral courage and all of these other protective factors that we're teaching. So you have the skills to deal with it. You're not just left struggling with, you don't know what to do. And mm -hmm. you, you just get in that deep, dark hole, which is very hard to get out of. Yeah. Great question. No, you do not have to experience it. And, and then Samantha, one of our juniors asks, what do you think is the biggest misconception when it comes to overall well-being and the development of resilience in nurses? Oh, that's a really good question. I think that, um, I think there's a misunderstanding as a whole still, even after all these years in what it really is. Um, I think a lot of people uh, use the word very loosely and we see it a lot in media, people talking about, I mean, I, it, it's amazing to me when I first started this work, honestly, I'll have to share that um, I had some mentors that told me that resilience wasn't even a relevant term <laughs> and that I needed to change my, oh my gosh. my project because no one really talked about it back then. And as you, you know, as I said, I had trouble finding information on it. It's overused now. And it's just thrown around and people throw it around and they don't know how special it is and what it really is and the potential in that. And so that's part of what I do is really try to break it down and help people understand this process and what it really means. It's not accepting a situation. It's not acquiescence. It's not um, just a, a substitute for taking action. It's very active response, okay? It's not passive at all. It's an active response where you are given back control. You take back control of the situation. And you, that's like Victor Frankl said, that's where you get your freedom back um, and, and doing that. And so just understanding all that, that definition, that's a big definition. It's two sentences, two long sentences, but it packs a wall up, as we say here in the South. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think that's the biggest thing they, that people don't really think about what it is and, and how it is developed. Mm -hmm. So maybe you all can help me with that. Maybe you all can start helping share that, that message. Yes. I think we'll have time for just two more. 
Okay. Um, have you, you've, you've authored publications and book chapters, but do you offer a book that our audience is wondering they could get? It's coming and it's actually called Life on Purpose. Um, and hopefully um, early spring, it will be on Amazon. Um, so I'm finishing that book up now and it's, it's a deeper dive into what I talked about tonight. And Thank this you is for after asking. you said you've been cutting back. Like, I'm yeah, well, sure I've, I've been writing this book for a long time, but yeah. I've, I'm a, I still fight perfectionism. You know, I've tried to let go of that and I have let go of it in a lot of ways, but there's so much I want to put in this book. And so I can, I'm going to have to just let go of it at some point, but yes, it is coming. Um, I also have a book on building resilient teams. And that's another part of this work. I work with a lot of organizations and um, have a couple of articles on resilient teams, but really applying these same principles to um, promoting change within an organization and how do you navigate change uh, through the development of a resilient team. So that one's coming as well, but life on purpose will come first. Yes. And, and for our last question, that you kind of gave me a great segue there because Vicki asks about, you know, nurses just performing tasks and getting them done. We, we know that. And but um, also about the importance of forming relationships. And what's your advice on how to build these relationships during stressful or busy shifts? And that was one question or a sort of comment slash question that I had. I feel like as a nurse who's been in practice a long time. And I still have a practice in the hospital. The relationships I have with people are what keep me going when I'm like, oh, when they retire, I'm not sure I can still do this. Like sometimes I feel that way. And I think when you talk about that team building and resilience uh, in organizations, you know, how can hospitals develop this? Because that is very important. If if I feel like these, if our new nurses can develop relationships and be strong together, you know, that will keep yes. them into in staying on, you know, that 60% that leaves, maybe that number will dwindle a bit, but Vicki Absolutely. wonders what it's, your advice about that might well, be. Well, the evidence clearly supports every bit of that. And in fact, I work a lot with uh, nurse residency programs and we know that it, it, it's of critical importance that there's a sense of community that's established immediately, a sense of belonging, mm -hmm. because we're meant to belong. We're meant to be connected to others. Um, there's some really great books on relational coordination. It's a theory and um, looking at it within healthy organizations and how important that is that relationships are developed. And you can even do that in a virtual environment just through connections. But truly connecting at the human level. And, you know, I, I encourage all new, new graduate nurses, what happens is there's a, a phenomenon called transition stress. And I, I work with um, uh, veterans who are transitioning from combat to civilian life. And uh, the ones that I have worked with are extreme PTSD, often post-suicide attempt. In that transition, they lose that sense of purpose. They, there's no meaning left. They don't know why they're even here anymore. Um, and so part of that is finding purpose again, but also it's the connections that have been lost. And that's one of the big things with transition stress is anytime we transition from one role to another or from one job to another, as like a nursing student transitions into a new graduate, you lose those connections that have fed you. Whether you've realized it or not, those relationships truly are your roots on that tree of resilience. Those are protective factors. You have to find those again. And so what I encourage you to do is maintain the connections you have and don't let go of those. So those people in your life that are your priorities, you really need to up the game in staying connected with them. Don't let that go to the side, whether it's, it's a phone call once a day, a coffee once a week, something to maintain connections with the people that really matter to you. And the community you've had as a nursing student Try to stay connected with them until you start to feel like you were developing that in the work environment, because it will take time. It takes time to build relationships. Find a mentor that you trust, that you connect with, and initiate that, okay? Having coffee, having lunch together, but don't let go of your other relationships, 
Okay, maintain those. Be consistent in um, staying connected to the people that matter to you. And that will feed you, feed those roots until you've established a new identity and a new community. Um, don't just go cold turkey. And that's where we see a lot of new graduates. The stress just is overwhelming because they don't feel they have those connections there anymore. They don't know who to go to. So that's one of the things that you need to look at when you're choosing a new job is what, do, how do they support you? How do they build a sense of community? What types of things do they offer that bring in those relationships? We think that a lot of people think that looks like fluff. It's not fluff. It is of critical importance to your success. So you need to be intentional in seeking out opportunities to connect, but also look at what they're doing on that side as well and feed your relationships that you have. Don't let go of those. Um, in one of my first studies, I look, I asked, you know, that question, who's there for you, no matter what. And um, that person often we don't see them or talk to them. Even though we know they're there for us, we don't take advantage of that. Um, we get really, really busy. And that's one of the things about being really intentional in how we spend our time is that we make it happen. You know, um, even if we're at a distance, I mean, I use my phone, you know, I'll just pick it up and, and give them a call or say, can we check in? Can we FaceTime? Can we Zoom? Whatever. Um, or even a text message works in a pinch if you can't do anything else. We're meant to live in community. We're human beings. We need relations. And um, I encourage you to, to really, really make that an intentional part of your life in work um, and in your personal life as well, because it truly does sustain us during difficult times. Mm -hmm. So true. Well, I think I think we could keep the questions going all night, <laughs> but I'm going, to, I'm going to stop it here. And thank you so much. We look forward to your book. We look forward to your program that you've generously given to all of us. We have taken a lot of your evening and planning since April. Thank <laughs> you for your patience with us. Thank you for bringing life on purpose to us this, tonight. It's been extraordinary. It's just wonderful. And thank we you so much. It. I've thank loved you. being with you and um, hope to meet you all in person one day, maybe thank when I visit too. Cooperstown. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll come visit you all at Hartwick, but, uh, it, it's been a pleasure. Honestly, it has, I've, I've loved getting to spend the evening with all of you. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night.